Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. One and all. Uh, it is Sunday. After uh, three Sundays worth of winter break, we are thrilled to be back with another edition of Tail Up Goat Wine School, a new semester of Tail Up Goat Wine School, the first semester of Tail Up Goat Wine School in a Biden-Harris uh, administration, uh, which we are hugely thankful for uh, in Washington, D.C., after being uh, locked down uh, for the better part of the uh, first couple weeks of the year. So uh, wherever you are joining us, thank you so much for taking time out of your Sunday and uh, continuing to make this a part of our or your routine, rather, uh, part of my routine, certainly, as well. It was a pleasure to catch up uh, with uh, some old faces uh, over the course of uh, the week. I hope that 2021 is treating you all uh, famously. Um, and uh, once again, you know, we're excited to be back at it and featuring some wines that uh, we neglected uh, throughout the course of, of 2020. I feel like it's only been three Sundays uh, that we missed, but it feels like it's been uh, ages. Uh, we've missed uh, an invasion of the nation's capital and overrunning the capital, uh, a, uh, another lockdown. Um, and uh, yet uh, we have emerged like a, a finery, fiery phoenix complete with Katy Perry and fireworks. Because if you're going to launch fireworks, you want to make sure that Katy Perry is supplying the soundtrack. So thank you for that, uh, Katy Perry. I think uh, Katy's a big wine lover uh, herself. So thank you for that as well. Uh, Katy Perry. We are celebrating a new uh, president, a new vice president, and um, we are celebrating after uh, four years of uh, national office holders not drinking. Both um, uh, former President uh, Trump and Vice President Pence uh, were teetotalers. Uh, we are celebrating um, uh, a wine lover, a bona fide onophile um, in national office, uh, none other than Kamala Harris, uh, Howard University grad, Bay Area born, uh, proper booty. Um, and uh, she loves her home state wine. She uh, was uh, until um, she assumed uh, the vice presidency, a member of the Congressional Wine Caucus. I'm excited that there is a Congressional Wine Caucus, but she was a proud member of that. Um, and uh, she loves her home state wine, uh, as all proper Californians are, are want to. Uh, we are celebrating uh, with Sonoma County uh, wines. Uh, we're, you know, kind of uh, venturing outside of Sonoma County for the sake of the Zins, but Sonoma, Sonoma County is kind of uh, our anchor uh, for the sake of this lesson uh, because uh, Kamala Harris, uh, the first female vice president, loves her some Sonoma County Chard. And uh, it is, you know, you know, for me, one of this wines that as a, you know, uh, obnoxious, uh, you know, contrarian uh, hipster psalm type is easy to poo-poo, but you know, I have to say it's really fun to revisit these wines because they are just, you know, immediately delicious, hugely pleasurable, and honestly better than they ever have been. So thank you, uh, among other things, Kamala Harris, for, um, you know, inspiring me to revisit Sonoma County and its delicious Chardonnays and Zinfandels. Uh, for those of you drinking at home, we have uh, two flights, three wines each, uh, Sonoma Chard and uh, Sonoma Zin. Uh, Sonoma-ish, Zen, um, and then uh, some bubbles uh, as well. Um, essentially, the house sparkler uh, at 1600 Pennsylvania uh, since uh, the last president uh, before Trump to be impeached. Uh, one Richard Nixon uh, started that tradition, um, and it has been the uh, traditional uh, sparkling wine of choice at 1600 Pennsylvania Ave ever since. So uh, we're going to close things out um, with Schramsberg uh, by offering a proper uh, toast uh, to uh, Madam uh, Vice President. But uh, without further ado, let's kick it off. Um, we've got a, a very nice crowd in the mix. Uh, thank you uh, for eschewing Dry January and joining us uh, for some wine today. I know a lot of people were committed to Dry January for six days and then, you know, shit happened. And, uh, you know, uh, January 6th felt like a good time uh, to break that streak. But, um, you know, uh, we should pour one out for those of um, those among us that are actually, uh, you know, uh, abstaining uh, for the month. Good on you, uh, abstainers. We're proud of you. Um, I want to offer a few shout outs to uh, some of our uh, loyal listeners. Uh, first of all, big ups to Janice Carnival. Uh, we have a YouTube channel 
Um, look out, um, YouTube stars, look out, cat videos, look out, gamers, look out, everyone. Wine School is coming for you. Uh, I think we're up to like five views on one of our most viewed, uh, <laughs> which is like, you know, a million uh, less than, you know, some Japanese cat has. But uh, we're coming for you, Japanese cats of the world. Look out. Um, uh, Janice made that happen. Thank you so much, uh, Janice. Um, uh, you know, you're the best. Uh, you know, this is an amazing community that I'm excited uh, to welcome back. Um, and you guys, you know, make it what it is. Uh, thank you, uh, Danielle, for amazing. I don't know if you're joining us, but Danielle was at uh, one of our outdoor events. And uh, she saw me straining my voice. And she gifted me this amazing microphone with speaker box. Um, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to... Oh, I, just, I, just should have, I didn't come prepared. I should have, should have been ready to fire this up. This is, uh, you know, already uh, we are, are um, you know, adding material to the 2021 blooper reel. But uh, we're going to fire this up for our next outdoor event. Um, uh, this color is not pink, mind you. It's rose gold. This is like rose gold. Uh, this is the truth. Uh, this will allow me, uh, you know, once we're able to hold more outdoor events um, to, you know, uh, favor everyone with my wine descriptions without straining my vocal cords. Thank you for that, uh, Danielle. And then uh, uh, lastly, uh, David Layton Lucas, who's uh, chief of staff to a congressional member from uh, Pennsylvania, uh, got me the gift that keeps on giving another wine reference work. Uh, you know, just when my wife uh, thought, you know, we didn't have enough wine books, you guys go and prove otherwise. Uh, a shout out, it should be said, for those of you uh, revisiting this lesson tomorrow, Monday, uh, I hope uh, your Green Bay Packers uh, made the Super Bowl. We have a lot of Packers fans uh, in our midst. Uh, thank you all. Uh, it's great to see you. Um, uh, needless to say, uh, I'm hugely grateful for you. Um, and excited to kick things off again. A bit of verse uh, to begin proceedings. As always, uh, first poem of the new year comes from uh, Ina Kulbrit, um, hip hip lady, niece of Joseph Smith. Yes, that Joseph Smith. Um, uh, like the uh, Mormon OG, uh, but she took a different path. She went the, you know, debauched San Francisco, you know, philosoph uh, and poet route. Um, and we are grateful that uh, uh, she did because uh, she became California's first poet laureate in 1915. Uh, uh, she hosted um, literary salons throughout uh, the tail end of the 19th century, welcomed uh, Mark Twain, Jack London, and uh, a whole generation of um, the Golden State's writers um, helmed uh, the uh, Oakland and San Francisco libraries for many years and, and wrote magnificent verse. Uh, this is an introduction uh, to a work about uh, Los Angeles. Uh, but, you know, certainly applicable for California as a whole. A breath of balm of orange bloom by what strange fancy wafted me through the lone starlight of the room that suddenly I seemed to see the long low veil with tawny edge of hills within the sunset glow. Cool vine rose through the cactus hedge and fluttering gleams of orchard snow. Far off the slender line of white against the blue of ocean's crest, the slow sun sinking into the night, a quivering opal in the west. Somewhere a stream sings far away, somewhere from out the hidden groves, and dreamy as a dying day comes the soft coo of morning doves. <laughs> One moment all the world is peace, the years like clouds are rolled away, and I am on those sunny leaves, a child amid the flowers at play. Um, beautiful bit of uh, verse there um, uh, from, from Ina. Um, you know, I, I have this um, kind of love-hate uh, relationship with, with California. Should be said, California makes um, uh, well over 80% uh, of uh, the wine uh, that um, is produced uh, domestically. Um, and uh, Californians love to play the um, if California was a state game. Um, and, you know, we got to give them props. If California was a state, um, it would make more wine than any country outside of the continent. Um, welcome back, Zoe Nystrom, uh, who is actually joining us from uh, the, uh, the L.A. area and uh, drinking uh, some local wine. Say hi to the people, Zoe. Hi everyone, I would just like to let you know that California is a state. It's the district that's still not a state, but we're a state. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, thank you for reminding um, <laughs> our, our mostly local audience that they are disenfranchised, Zoe. We appreciate that. Um, uh, brilliant. Uh, so uh, without further ado, we're going to uh, drink like Kamala uh, today. 
uh, which begs the question, how does Kamala drink? So um, here is uh, the new uh, vice president, uh, daughter of an uh, Indian born biologist uh, from Tamil Nadu state, um, which is uh, the Southern end of uh, the Indian subcontinent. Um, and uh, her father, a uh, economics professor from Jamaica. And we're gonna find uh, ways to tease uh, in uh, that, um, you know, uh, dual ancestry for the sake of the Zins that we're drinking um, uh, later. But uh, Kamala, born in Oakland, uh, went to Howard, uh, sisters of uh, Alpha Kappa Alpha, rise up. I'm sorry, I'm not wearing my green and pink uh, today. Um, uh, purple, green and purple, I apologize, AKA. Uh, uh, at any rate, um, she uh, worked her way from uh, Bay Area District Attorney to California um, Attorney General to Senator uh, to the Vice President's office. Um, and all the while, um, she had a glass of wine in her hand, a uh, member, as I mentioned, of the Congressional Wine Caucus, um, which has the mission of uh, protecting the interests of our vibrant wine community from grape to glass. Um, nice, nice mission. Uh, good on you, Congressional Wine Caucus. Um, I need to do more research about uh, who, who's a member, because they, they should all be members of the Congressional Wine Caucus. Um, uh, I did some, you know, internet sleuthing, some half-ass internet research. Um, you know, from what I can gather, she loves her California uh, shard. I've not had the pleasure of waiting on Kamala, uh, sadly. Um, uh, the esteemed uh, friend of wine school, Brent Kroll, has on several occasions uh, and can attest to her love of Cali Shard. Um, uh, we are drawing our inspiration for the sake of one of these wines, uh, David Rainey Chardonnay, uh, from a bet that Kamala lost with uh, that evil troll, Ted Cruz, um, who apparently drinks, I guess, but uh, they wagered wine on the outcome of the Astros Dodgers game um, uh, in 2017. Kamala lost uh, that bet and delivered to Ted a few bottles of David Rainey Chardonnay, which we're going to drink. David Rainey is an old friend. I've had the pleasure of uh, waiting on and trading uh, missives with David Ramey over the years. Uh, he's kind of like the high priest of Cali Shard um, in, in the modern era. Uh, we do know that uh, Kamala is a member of wine clubs uh, at hipster urban wineries like Rock Wall. Um, she is also uh, a, uh, a regular um, at uh, Cork Wine Bar. So uh, Diane and Khalid, uh, Khalid, uh, who, who are uh, equally uh, friends of... Um, uh, the, well, they're friends of the restaurant um, and, and lovely, lovely people, uh, it should be said. Um, and the Cork Wine Bar, um, you know, in particular, um, you know, really was a, a trailblazer uh, in its own way, um, both on uh, 14th Street um, and, you know, for the sake of, you know, the kinds of wines that they featured. Um, Kamala has hosted, I think, several fundraisers uh, there. And um, uh, it's Khalid, um, you know, to Kamala's left, Diane to her right. And they have already declared, they've staked out a claim for themselves as Kamala's, uh, you know, wine bar of choice. Um, Diane Kali, we're coming for you. Uh, I want you to know that we're coming after you, uh, coming after that throne. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, it's going to be a few months. Uh, at any rate, um, we are celebrating uh, Sonoma uh, in uh, Kamala's uh, honor. And we are supplementing, um, you know, the white with Zinfandel because Zinfandel is hugely fascinating grape with a hugely... Uh, you know, a compelling history uh, in America, uh, long thought to be America's uh, native grape, even though it isn't. Um, we kind of, you know, made it our own in, in California and, um, you know, we're long overdue uh, for a Zinfandel lesson. So, um, you know, I thought it'd be fun to explore that red-white uh, duality. Um, we're gonna kick things off here um, with uh, a consideration of uh, Sonoma uh, geography. Um, uh, Sonoma is a county uh, synonymous with an American viticultural area. So we're going to talk AVAs a little bit uh, today. AVAs is uh, American Viticultural Area, it stands for, and uh, it is the uh, U.S. Department of Agriculture's uh, half-assed attempt um, to, um, you know, kind of emulate the uh, designation of origin system that, you know, the French and others uh, have applied. Now, um, in America stateside, it is essentially a geographical des designation and nothing more, whereas in the old world, uh, it would carry with it all sorts of, um, you know, criteria for the sake of the types of grapes that the wines were made of and, um, you know, the quality of those wines and the typicity of those wines. Uh, we are uncomfortable stateside with that level of American uh, intervention in our drinking life. So um, uh, ADAs uh, just um, essentially uh, create a, a boundary zone 
uh, for a, a wine community as such. And um, Sonoma County here, um, which is this little triangle shaped uh, county that, um, you know, stretches from, uh, you know, Annapolis inland to Lake County and down to the San Pablo Bay. Um, it corresponds with an ADA called Sonoma, um, and uh, there are 18 sub-ADAs contained therein. Um, uh, we're going to come back to this map um, in, in good time because we love maps, and uh, you all, you know, I'm guessing haven't been rifling through your wine atlases, and we want to make up uh, for lost time. Um, but uh, it should be said that uh, Sonoma has this really amazing place in American wine history. Um, Sonoma uh, itself was home to the Bear Flag Revolt. So the um, uh, state of California grew out of originally um, uh, northern uh, Mexico, which split off um, from Mexico uh, in the midst of a revolt, um, June 14, uh, 1847. And on that day in Sonoma, California, they raised the bear flag for the first time. So this is the Lone Star Bear Flag. This is the very design that was raised above uh, Sonoma on June 14th, 1846. And for, um, <laughs> for a, a beautiful, um, you know, uh, couple, several week period, um, not unlike our winter break, um, the citizens of California um, were a breakaway republic. Um, I feel like a lot of them would like to return um, to that, you know, Halcyon era, but um, uh, it ended on July 9th when um, a, a group of uh, U.S. soldiers uh, intervened, uh, having already uh, inaugurated the Mexican-American War and raised uh, the Stars and Stripes. And uh, sadly, uh, the, uh, what is the, the, the California Great Bear flag was mothballed until it was adopted um, as the state flag uh, thereafter. Um, more significantly, it should be said, um, uh, the Mexican missionaries who made their way to Sonoma did a lot to advance the cause of wine in California. So uh, Padre Jose, uh, Jesus, uh, sorry, Jose, uh, not Jesus, Jose, um, uh, worshiping Jesus, but uh, Jose Altimira, um, uh, as early as 1820, planted thousands of acres of vines. Um, and by the time that um, uh, the half-assed revolutionaries declared a California Republic um, on June 14th of 1848, um, the, the area, um, you know, known as California, um, was already generating, um, you know, tens of thousands of dollars in income from its wants, um, you know, amazingly enough. And then um, shortly after um, California became a state, uh, the legislature enlisted a Hungarian gentleman, Augustin uh, uh, <laughs> Hera Harassi, um, uh, immigrants hugely important uh, to the life of the Golden State as they are to our own life, um, and uh, hopefully feeling more welcome uh, under our current administration. But uh, at any rate, a Hungarian was commissioned by the California legislature uh, to head off to Europe, and in 1861, uh, he brought back uh, 100,000 cuttings, um, all of which is to say, you know, much of what um, then became a thriving um, wine industry in California, and there was a thriving wine industry in California um, that grew up between the end of the Civil War and Prohibition, um, uh, owes its life to these cuttings that were developed by um, these old Spanish missionaries and uh, this Hungarian immigrant who's enlisted by the California legislature, uh, such that by the uh, beginning of Prohibition, uh, there were 256 wineries uh, operating in Sonoma, and there's this massive um, Sonoma wine uh, industry. Uh, sadly, um, our, uh, you know, unique um, uh, experiment in um, 86-ing uh, alcoholic beverages, uh, which lasted well over a decade, reduced that number to uh, less than 50. Um, that number only rebounded within the last decade. So only within the last decade uh, have we uh, gotten back to that uh, 256 and surpassed that number uh, in Sonoma County, which is, is pretty remarkable. Um, now, uh, we're going to consider um, uh, Sonoma uh, County uh, itself and kind of what separates it um, from, uh, you know, the other uh, growing regions of uh, California. And uh, chiefly, I think, um, that is its uh, identity uh, as a, a cooler uh, climate than a lot of people, um, you know, are accustomed to. Um, for the sake of California. So we're going to pull up a map of the state here, and you can see the golden, the great golden state of California um, on the western edge of uh, the United States. Um, and, um, you know, much of what we think of uh, uh, in the context of California wine comes from the Central Valley. So um, this area that uh, stretches along the San Joaquin River south from San Sacramento and makes a lot of really unremarkable bulk wine and, um, you know, has, you know, uh, incredible 
um, uh, amount of, uh, you know, kind of reliable sunshine um, and, you know, relatively low rainfall um, that, you know, with the addition of water in the form of irrigation, um, you know, gives you incredibly, um, you know, uh, profound, um, you know, robust, huge harvests um, year in and year out, reliable harvests um, that have fueled uh, the jug wine industry uh, for as long as there has been wine in America. But what's interesting about Sonoma is that you're closer to the coast. Um, and, um, you know, in California, um, you know, geography is less about north-south, um, and um, it is uh, much more about uh, proximity to the sea. And um, Sonoma um, owes its uh, coolness to its proximity to the sea and, and largely to um, these gaps in the coastal mountains. So the most famous of which is this Petaluma Gap. Um, so you can see here a uh, Bodega Bay, um, the Spanish may have gone, but, you know, they left us all sorts of amazing names. Um, and uh, Bodega Bay um, uh, opens up um, uh, the uh, mouth of the Pacific um, to these inland valleys. And as these valleys warm, as the air warm, they essentially suck in cool air and fog uh, from these bays up these river valleys. And uh, this is the Russian River, um, uh, you know, snaking its way, um, uh, actually, uh, here. Uh, to the to the north, um, and that fog, um, you know, has you know really significant influence on the local climate. Um, it's this cooling influence on the local climate, you know, such that you know uh, in these areas affected by the fog, you know, you are ten degrees uh, Fahrenheit, twenty degrees Fahrenheit cooler um, uh, than you would be uh, in inland valleys separated from the cooling influence uh, that the Petaluma Gap and areas like the Petaluma Gap, um, you know, have uh, to offer. Um, now, we're going to start off with um, some uh, Russian River Valley shards here, and a Russian River Valley Chardonnay uh, from one uh, David Ramey, uh, for the sake of our, our tasting. And uh, this particular uh, Russian River Valley Chardonnay, um, you know, uh, hails uh, from uh, multiple vineyard sites. So it's not a single uh, vineyard wine. It's kind of a, a pan Russian River Valley uh, snapshot. But I want to pull up another image of uh, the AVA itself, because it's, it's kind of large. And you can see the Russian River Valley um, snakes its way along the northern edge of the AVA, but the AVA itself extends further south. Now, this is hugely controversial. Um, the AVA has steadily grown from um, a, a true um, kind of geographical representation of the vineyards close to the Russian River uh, to encompass um, these southern areas. And these southern areas are far enough away from the Ru Russian River Valley and far enough away from the Petulum Gap, which you see defined on the southern edge of this map, that they're a lot hotter. The only reason that um, this area is really part of the ABA is because uh, um, E and J Gallo has enough money uh, to throw at the problem. Um, so uh, these southern areas are less a reflection of you know, the geographical area that is the Russian River Valley than they are a, a shameless marketing ploy by a large um, you know, winery entity that is Gallo. Um, David Ramey is based just outside of Healdsburg, and most of his vineyards um, uh, are uh, along uh, the Russian River Valley uh, proper, um, just kind of uh, south and west of Chalk Hill, which is a slightly warmer site um, in the context of uh, the Russian River Valley. And it should be said that the further away you get from the river, um, the, the warmer these sites get. And, um, you know, there are a lot of really beautiful images of the valley itself um, and this, you know, kind of uh, mist of fog uh, descending, um, you know, over the course of uh, days um, in the Russian River. Um, it is a preposterously beautiful region. You know, this whole notion of manifest destiny um, is kind of easily to understand when you land in a place, um, you know, as verdant, as beautiful um, as uh, Sonoma, as parts of California. It's a lot easier to grow grapes here than it is in Chardonnay's traditional home, of, of Burgundy. Um, you know, there is uh, less danger of losing your fruit to periodic rains or frost. Um, you know, you're going to get a reliable harvest year in, year out. And uh, typically the first, um, you know, it should be said the first immigrants to uh, this region discovered that, you know, the lower lying slopes were better for white grapes like uh, Chardonnay uh, that, you know, wanted that cooling influence. And uh, the upper slopes that needed um, you know, the additional uh, ripening hours that the sun provides. Um, the first Italian immigrants uh, to Sonoma uh, planted to uh, Zinfandel. And a lot of those vineyards uh, were um, not pulled out during Prohibition because it was too expensive for them to do so. 
Uh, it was more expensive to pull them out than it was to just leave them, which is why uh, Sonoma in particular has a lot of centenarian plots. So you have these, you know, um, vineyards um, that people like Martinelli um, are working with and uh, will taste that wine uh, later on, you know, that are over 100 years old. And, you know, um, you know, that, you know, kind of uh, blast from the past, uh, you know, owes itself um, to, you know, this peculiar experiment of prohibition, but also owes itself to the long tradition of grape growing and winemaking um, in Sonoma. So without further ado, uh, let's taste uh, David Ramey's wine. So David Ramey is hugely accomplished um, UC Davis grad. Um, he got his start um, and uh, as a, a literature um, uh, grad um, from uh, UC Santa Cruz, um, but uh, decided that, you know, he didn't want to teach English as uh, he originally suspected, decided um, that, you know, uh, wine might be a lot more interesting as a career path. This is him uh, with his family um, in their, you know, humble winery. And um, he is part of this, you know, generation that came out of UC Davis in the late 70s, Kathy Corson, John Kongsgaard, among them, who really established um, California wine, um, you know, alongside uh, the great, you know, chateaus, domains, of the old world. Um, and he worked with some of those great domains. So uh, he uh, cut his teeth um, at Chateau Petrus uh, on the right bank of Bordeaux, working with Jean-Pierre Moyeau. Um, he consulted for uh, a million people, Chalk Hill, Matanzas Creek, Dominus in, in um, California before launching his own label uh, in 1996. And Chardonnay is very much his bag. Uh, we're drinking his Russian River Valley Shard. Um, uh, David Ramey, hugely thoughtful. What I love about him, he calls Shard uh, a red wine uh, drinker's uh, white grape. So, you know, for him, um, you know, it's very much, um, you know, kind of a red grape in, in white wine, you know, clothing. And that's because um, it is, uh, you know, kind of the rare white wine that relies on malolactic fermentation and oak, um, uh, you know, for uh, the sake of its its vinification and, and alabage. And, you know, those are things, you know, for the sake of malolactic and for the sake of, um, of a wine wearing oak that have become, you know, unfashionable um, in, uh, you know, the natural uh, wine community. But uh, I think, you know, tasting through these wines, you get a sense of, you know, what they have to recommend them, what they have to offer the wines and what people love about them, what, you know, the Kamala Harris's of the world love about these wines. Um, uh, Zoe, uh, you have some experience with, uh, with uh, David Ramey's wines. Uh, what you like um, about them? Um, I always think that he uses that little bit of lees aging, and so they have that like nutty kind of like brioche quality to it. That they're always just so well balanced, and you know he has the benefit of using some older vines, and it's just classic every single year. You know, yeah, it's like an apple pie. It's like uh, so traditional and so um, consistent. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, David says about Chardonnay, it's the most compelling white wine in the world. It's the red wine of whites. Um, good Chardonnay can be grown uh, anywhere uh, along the California coast as long as the coastal range lets the fog through. Um, he thinks that the Russian River Valley uh, provides this perfect balance of cool nights and warm days. So you get a bit of richness with your crisp acidity. And for the sake of this one, we have a wine that goes through full malolactic fermentation. So um, what, pray tell, is malolactic fermentation? Zoe, I'm putting you on the spot. Um, explain malolactic for the kids at home. Yeah, sure. So um, if you want to think about it as like taking the um, tartaric acid into lactic acid. So maybe thinking about like apple skins and how astringent and um, acidic they can be and turning those acids into something that's lactic or like creamy like milk makes it a lot softer and a little bit more supple and you're able to um, pick up on a lot more flavors um, without that um, austerity in the background too. Yeah, so grapes contain uh, three major constituents for the sake of types of acid. Um, they contain tartaric acid, most importantly, malic acid, a little bit of citric acid and others, but grapes themselves do not contain a uh, lactic acid, which is the acid in, in, in yogurt. Um, malolactic fermentation is a secondary uh, fermentation process. It happens after the conversion of sugar to alcohol, and it transfers uh, or it uh, you know uh, transforms malic acid which is the green apple acid into lactic acid and co2 which obviously uh, flies out of the barrel um, and it creates other con other chemical constituents like uh, diacetyl um, which gives you that brown buttery uh, flavor but it transforms the texture of a wine and I think um, what I love about David Ramey's wines is that texturally they're really compelling um, and really interesting and, and David Ramey has said himself that you know working in the old world, working with, you know, these 
um, icons of French winemaking, um, you know, like Jean-Pierre uh, Moyot, who's this like um, hugely famous uh, gentleman winemaker from Bordeaux, an art collector. And he said that tasting with them, working with them, really um, clued him into the fact that, you know, at the end of the day, texture uh, was as important as definable tasting notes for the sake of his offerings. Um, now, next up, we're going to taste another wine, uh, also from the Russian River Valley, uh, but this one from a smaller uh, estate, more of a mom and pop. Um, and they were making wine in the Russian River Valley well before it was fashionable to do so, and doing so on a, a, a fabulously uh, small scale, um, it should be said. Um, and uh, this is at uh, Porter Creek. Um, and I really love uh, the blokes at uh, Porter Creek, um, the winery currently run uh, by Alex, although his father um, founded uh, the estate once upon a time in 1977. And it is, you know, a true, you know, kind of farm uh, winery. So it is, you know, very much um, a, a working farm that happens to make wine in the best possible sense. And, um, you know, we're talking about a set of wines here that, um, you know, don't necessarily exist in that, you know, kind of narrow um, natural wine world, but wines that are made naturally. So these are, for the sake of our tasting, all fermented with native yeast, um, you know, but, uh, you know, you have winemakers that are taking cues from the old world as much as they are the new world, and um, they're using oak to benevolent ends. So, um, you know, the Porter Creek stylistically, um, you know, they tend to block, um, you know, mallow. Um, so, you know, it's not like flipping a switch for the sake of mallow lactic in the sense that it's all or nothing. Um, I don't know what the exact percentage is on this wine, but you know, uh, I know in past vintages they have blocked malolactic on some of their lots. Um, so, you know, some of the wine goes to malolactic, some of it doesn't, depending on, you know, uh, the particular vintage and the particular flavor profile that the producer that Alex Davis is after. Um, this is a shot of their adorable, um, you know, kind of barn and tasting room, um, you know, uh, impossible to social distance there. You're able, elbow to elbow with the, the tasting manager and the winemaker. Um, uh, you know, Alex lives on the farm um, with his uh, wife and uh, two daughters. Um, you know, it's, you know, small scale artisanal American winemaking in the best possible sense, you know, and, and on its second generation. Um, you know, for me, this is a funny wine because I think, you know, in a lot of ways, um, the, the new oak, um, which is um, actually more prevalent than in the Ramey wine. So 15% new oak for the sake of David's wine, 25% for the sake of this wine is, is more readily apparent, but the acid feels, you know, slightly uh, a tick higher as well. So it's both, you know, um, you know, brighter and more searing in its own way, but also has more of that you know, kind of butterscotchy, um, you know, uh, new oak uh, influence uh, to it. Um, and then lastly, before we get to questions, we're gonna uh, deal with a wine that is from uh, the Sonoma Coast. Um, and uh, the Sonoma Coast um, is kind of a, a bit of a, a new frontier um, for uh, the sake of uh, wines uh, from Sonoma. And, um, you know, as the world warms, um, you know, as we, um, you know, come to terms um, with uh, the climate that we have now, as opposed to the climate that we had, you know, for the last several decades, you see, uh, you know, winemakers that favored formerly cool sites in the Russian River Valley that are now warming, um, they are escaping to the coast. Um, and again, that coastal proximity gives you more oceanic influence. And uh, in this case, um, you have a site that is just west of a single vineyard wine that's just west of um, the Green Valley. Um, and a winemaker who went to George Washington once upon a time, um, Go Colonials, um, and uh, started his wine career working at a local retail outlet, became a ski bum for a while, found his way um, to Joseph Phelps Winery in Napa and never looked back. But Faber Chardonnay at Vila um, and works with single vineyards in the Sonoma Coast. Uh, it's a sprawling ABA um, that is really kind of meaningless because it's so sprawling. Uh, but what I love about this wine is you get this crystal clean mineral driven you know, um, you know, green apple full, you know, it's a, there's a purity to this wine, but a, a richness to it as well. And this is another one uh, that sees some new oak, it sees 15% new oak. It also sees a bit of time in concrete egg or a portion of the wine does uh, for 11 months. So, you know, all of these wines see time in new oak um, and they wear it very differently. So oak, just like anything in life, not a one way uh, street, you, you know, uh, oak, you know, has many, um, you know, shades of gray to it. Um, you know, for the sake of the wines that we're considering. Um, and, you know, oak, you can wear well, um, you know, just like I wouldn't look good in Kamala Harris's inauguration dress 
you know, certain wines wouldn't look good in new oak um, and, you know, uh, other wines, uh, you know, wear it better. And I think, you know, Chardonnay is one of those wines that wears it well, you know, so why not lean into that? Zoe, um, what do you have from the commentary so far um, about these three wines, about the new year, about the wine drinking vice president? Um, to start off, how do we know um, what is quality wine um, when they say Sonoma on a label? When is it really from Sonoma? Do we need to know specifically the particular like wineries and where they own land? How can we figure that out? Uh, excellent question, Zoe. Bingo uh, for someone at home. Um, uh, it should be said that uh, the ADA system, uh, which ultimately regulates um, uh, labeling in the United States uh, is pretty um, kind of uh, fast and loose with that whole, um, you know, point of origin. Um, now, they can regulate it on an ABA by ABA, um, you know, kind of basis more stringently, but they tend not to do that in California. So about 15% of an individual wine um, that is labeled Sonoma or Napa could actually come from outside. That tends to happen more in Napa than just Sonoma because uh, Sonoma produces a lot more wine than Napa. Um, uh, you know, Napa only produces about 4% of California's wines, even though it accounts for about 20% of the sales. Um, so you can see why there is financial incentive there, typically to bring in fruit from like Lake County or Mendocino and blend it in with your Napa uh, Valley fruit, um, you know, up to that 15% threshold. That will happen as well in Sonoma. Um, but uh, Sonoma is a huge geographical area. You know, we're not dealing with, you know, the Finger Lakes, which is relatively compact or, you know, um, you know, France, you know, God forbid, which, you know, is dealing in old world distances. We are dealing in, you know, huge swaths of land and, and Sonoma is, is massive. Um, you know, that said, how do you know that you're dealing with, you know, uh, someone that is, you know, truly interested in Sonoma uh, terroir? I would say look past Sonoma and look for people that are trading in, you know, sub Sonoma Appalachians. So, you know, uh, Sonoma is so hugely varied um, that I think the, the more, um, you know, kind of uh, responsible actors, the more intellectual curious actors are trading in these sub ABAs. So they're going to be trading in not Sonoma as such, they're going to be, you know, Sonoma Coast. Uh, Fort Ross is like the new hotness in Sonoma Coast. Um, and people are trying to define these kind of you know, sub parcels that make Sonoma, you know, unique um, and interesting. Um, there's a, a pretty, you know, you're along a fault line. So in the Sonoma coast, the San Andreas fault runs the length of it. And anytime you're along a fault, you get this great diversity of soil types. Uh, in the Russian River Valley, you're chiefly dealing with, with what's called uh, Gold Ridge uh, series, uh, like loams, which are, are heavier soils, but they shed water uh, uh, really well, you know, but there's just like a huge diversity um, of terroirs here. Um, and so I think, you know, broadly speaking, I would try to seek out those people that, you know, are, are sub-identifying or, or throwing their lot, you know, with, uh, you know, a more specific designation as opposed to just saying Sonoma. I don't know. It just came on. Uh, what else you got, Zay? <clears throat> um, whose fault is White Zen? Do we know? Um, that's an excellent question. Um, uh, that is actually Setter Holmes' fault. Um, uh, oh, initially... Fun. Yeah, yeah. So uh, not only, um, you know, am I drinking uh, a, a 90 point scoring whites in, I'm drinking the original whites in. Uh, <laughs> and uh, that resulted from a stuck fermentation. So um, a stuck fermentation uh, occurs uh, when um, a wine, uh, the yeast kind of quit um, on the wine and, and uh, they no longer ferment and you're left with um, uh, residual sugar. You're left with a, a sweet wine, uh, sugar that, you know, otherwise you would want to consume for the sake of conversion to alcohol. Um, but, you know, that's stopped. Now, um, it should be said that uh, historically, and even in the modern era, a lot of Chardonnays from California, um, uh, you know, also kind of result from stuck fermentations in the sense that, you know, those, those mass marketed shards, even those mass marketed pinots that people love, like the Naomi's of the world, um, they're sweet. You know, they just are. Um, and that extra sugar kind of elevates the perception of fruit in a wine. You know, one of the cool things about Chard is that it's this amazing chameleon. It's a winemaker's varietal. It does a lot of different things really well. So, you know, you get a Sonoma Coast wine that tastes like oyster, oyster shells, even with an added overlay of new oak. And then you taste something, you know, you know from David Ramey, um, you know, corner of the Russian River Valley that's more voluptuous. And then it gets more voluptuous still in like a, you know, kind of fruit roll-up uh, kind of way that, you know, we don't like to explore. Um, you know, but 
uh, people are still, you know, a, a lot of uh, wine nerds or, or, or kind of disgruntled psalms will say that, you know, people don't like talk dry, but drink sweet, which is to say that, you know, uh, they say they want a dry wine, but at the end of the day, they want something with a little bit of, of residual sugar that, you know, enhances the fruit uh, in their, in their wine. So, um, you know, that happened in particularly Sonoma and Napa, um, uh, you know, starting with the right white Zin craze, um, you know, because people realized that, you know, it was something that consumers enjoy, you know, they're responding. Uh, to the marketplace and you know creating a brand for themselves what else you got Jeff? i love that one-liner <laughs> um, um what do you think about the vintage 2019 with all of the fires how does soil affect um when it has a ton of ash in it yeah so i mean uh smoke taint is a is a real thing on wines um and uh yeah, in 2019, uh, Sonoma was de devastated by, by fires. Uh, this year, you know, uh, other parts of Northern California were. Um, typically, it's more of an issue with red wines than whites um, uh, because, uh, you know, uh, although historically, uh, a lot of California wines, uh, California Chardonnays in particular, did see some skin contact. Um, they weren't orange wines as such. It was just essentially another way to give a wine weight. Um, uh, but um, in the modern era, they're direct pressed. Uh, so as long as, um, you know, the, the um, source of the fire is not uh, hugely proximate, um, you can still save a lot of Chardonnay, um, uh, you know, in, in problematic vintages, but um, uh, that's impossible with a lot of red wines. Um, so um, red wines were, were more adversely uh, affected. Um, you know, I think the horrifying thing is that, you know, at the, at the end of the day, um, uh, obviously, you know, a lot of acres were burned um, this year, but, you know, this is a, a, a climate pattern that's likely to perpetuate itself. And um, you can see here, this is, um, uh, these are, are, are what are called uh, Winkler regions. Winkler was a professor at UC Davis, and uh, it's a measure of um, essentially growing degree hours um, uh, or growing degree days. Um, and that's, uh, you know, during the growing season as measured between April and the end of October. Um, and essentially the um, amount of um, kind of uh, photosynthesis forwarding sun that these regions get. Um, and, and I like this map because they highlighted the Napa Valley and you get a sense that, um, you know, these region five areas um, and particularly uh, this white region you can see here at the center of the Central Valley, that's like raisin country. You know, the white areas are not fit for um, viticulture. The red areas are not fit for fine wine making. Um, and so you can see, you know, as these red areas creep their way to the coast, you know, uh, it becomes much more hard or much more difficult to, to work with cooler climate varietals like Pinot and Chard. So a lot of people who love Pinot and Chard, that's why they're uh, fleeing to the coast, to these blue regions. And that's why they're fleeing further north to uh, Oregon, um, you know, as you can see. But, you know, equally, um, you know, these uh, conditions will create more um, favorable um, you know, environment for wildfires. And, and so I think that's the big fear in the region. It's, it's you, know, um, you know, a mix of, you know, the devil we know and, you know, the devil that, you know, we are, um, you know, worried will continue to perpetuate itself as the world continues to um, warm over the coming, the coming decades. And, you know, I am someone that loves wines that come from marginal climates, that come from cool climates. And, you know, I think a lot of California growers worry that there won't be, won't be a future uh, for them. Um, you know, maybe in Chardonnay because it's so versatile, but, you know, Chardonnay gets flabby, you know, Chardonnay, it just, it just loses its luster, um, you know, so there's a lot of fear that, you know, the wines that, you know, people love in these regions now, you know, they won't be capable of making, um, you know, in by 2050 uh, in particular. What else you guys have? Uh, there was a really interesting question about where um, both like library selections of wines are held and then also what was aging. So it doesn't necessarily matter the year in which there is a fire, but if that winery is then holding two to three vintages back of red wine in different aging ways, but then also their library wines and like how much is destroyed when these things happen. Yeah, I mean, as long as the winery is not consumed, then it's not, not an issue, um, obviously. Um, you know, uh, most of, you know, the producers uh, in Sonoma and Napa, um, you know, release their wines right away, um, you know, because it's, it's liquidity and it's hard to hold back wine, um, you know, uh, from the market because, 
you know, you're reducing your, your cash flow. Um, it's an expensive proposition to hold, to hold wine back. Um, you know, it is the case in some instances where you have wines that have, you know, extended elevages in oak that, you know, there'll be a, a vintage or two, you know, a uh, gap for the, for the sake of the wine. Um, you know, but I think the, for the reds, the fire is a bigger concern for the sake of smoke taint uh, in the cellar than it is, you know, um, overrunning the cellars uh, in, in most cases, because, you know, the, the fires, you know, they're, they're, you know, hugely widespread, but the bigger fear is the smoke cloud that is even more widespread, um, you know, at the end of the day. Um, which brings us to, I think, you know, uh, Zinn, uh, because I'm really excited uh, for the trio of wines um, that, you know, brought in because um, they, you know, kind of uniquely uh, speak to, um, you know, uh, our uh, new vice president's um, uh, immigrant roots. And um, that is not, you know, easy to come by um, uh, in, in the wine world. I don't, we're, we're featuring um, a, a wine uh, from uh, Italian American OGs um, uh, or six generation farmers, um, the first black family um, to uh, bottle their own wines in Napa and uh, a Jewish Thai um, <laughs> uh, former skateboarder, snowboarder. So, you know, that's not necessarily representative of, you know, uh, the, the broader wine world as such. But, you know, uh, I'm usually excited uh, that these uh, voices uh, exist um, in uh, the wine world and, you know, want to celebrate them. Uh, but, you know, we have a little bit uh, to, um, you know, kind of disambiguate for the sake of uh, the history of Zinn, which is fucking awesome. Uh, so uh, Zinfandel, I see you. Um, uh, Zinfandel has some of the oldest plantings um, in uh, California. Uh, it was one of, uh, you know, the first grapes kind of uh, widely planted um, in the state. It's actually um, not the most late ripening uh, varietal in the world. Uh, it accumulates sugar really well, but it ripens earlier than, you know, like your Petite Verdots, your Grenaches, uh, your own uh, red varietals uh, of the world. So it does pretty well in a place like the Russian River, you know, although it does need you know, those slopes above the fog line. Um, I love the way vines take on their own personality. This is a vine on the uh, Martinelli estate um, and uh, it's old bush trained Zinn. And you know, these are centenarian vines. The only reason they exist is because, um, you know, uh, we made wine verboten uh, for a decade and change and it was too expensive to pull them out. Um, and there are all sorts of uh, library, um, uh, you know, vineyards um, that are now actually protected under state law um, uh, in California, um, these plantings, um, many of which date, date back to the 1880s um, and have a lot to say about the history of California wine. And what's cool is that, you know, these are virus riddled vines and the yields are minuscule, but, you know, just like, you know, your Jewish grandfather has a lot of really interesting stories to tell, you know, these wines have a lot of really interesting stories to tell. Uh, Zinfandel has a lot of interesting stories to tell. So it's a long supposed as Zinfandel was America's vine and wine. Um, uh, but it should be said that, you know, thoughtful actors knew that couldn't be the case because the grape species Vitis vinifera that we know and love um, that goes into fine wine did not originate in America. Um, we know that uh, it originated in Transcaucasia and they certainly knew, um, you know, that even uh, in uh, the early, you know, it should be said even in the, you know, uh, early to mid uh, 20th century. Um, you know, what I, I, I do wanna say though is that, you know, the origins of Zinn were shrouded in mystery um, until relatively recently. Uh, so um, actually a, a pioneering uh, UC Davis anthropographer named Carol Meredith, um, who's awesome, who I hope to do a wine school with someday, um, uh, kind of uh, took it upon herself to unravel the origins of Zinfandel beginning in the 90s. And she discovered that, um, what had long been suspected actually um, uh, by uh, Croatians who found their way uh, to Northern California. Chief among them, Mike Gigrich, who will figure prominently in the Brown Estate story later, all of this cross-pollination, um, that uh, Zinfandel uh, uh, bore a, a similarity to some Croatian bridles and also to some Southern Italian bridles, chiefly Primitivo. Uh, so uh, Primitivo is the, the most widely grown grape in the heel of the boot in Puglia. It made its way to uh, New York. Um, and from there um, uh, on cuttings made its way to California um, and was planted widely uh, in Sonoma, but it didn't originate in, in, in uh, Puglia. It actually originated in modern day Croatia 
under the name. Hold your breath, everybody. Apologies to all the Croatians in the house. Sluzhenak uh, Kastilansky. Um, and Carol Meredith actually went to Croatia to um, uh, take DNA from all sorts of Croatian samples to determine its roots. And she now calls Zinfandel ZPC, which stands for Zinfandel Primitivo, hold your breath, Sluzhenak Kistelansky. Um, uh, so uh, the cool kids say uh, CPC, but originally Croatian great. Uh, uh, and um, that wasn't, uh, you know, uh, discovered um, uh, and, and, and scientifically rigorously documented uh, until 2001. Um, uh, and Carol Maris gave this like really fascinating uh, interview, interview with, um, uh, you know, a uh, friend of uh, the pod, uh, Levy Dalton, about, you know, unraveling all this. Um, but uh, Zin, you know, it, you know, has this like peculiar history in Sonoma and this peculiar origin story. But again, you know, I think it speaks to, as a nation, our immigrant roots in a way that I really, you know, dig. So, you know, even the grapes have these murky immigrant backgrounds in a way that, you know, I think is, is hugely poetic for the sake of this wine. So we're going to start off with uh, this wine from Mendocino County. So we're going to kind of work in reverse order. Um, and uh, this one comes from um, uh, again, so, um, I feel like somewhere linguists, um, you know, and then God is like the original linguist, but he's laughing at us through the sake of languages. Croatian, definitely one of them. Um, Thai, uh, equally one of them. So, uh, everybody hold your breath. Um, uh, winemaker here is Kenny, uh, Lakeet Prakom, Lakeet Prakom. And for some reason, my Thai is better, uh, than, uh, my Croatian. Uh, but Kenny is himself an OG. Uh, grew up um, in the wine world, but like hugely social justice oriented. Um, he is like a, a massive uh, Woody Guthrie uh, fan. Um, and uh, for each bottle of his wine, gives 1% to the planet, um, is hugely current, concerned with the diversity of his workforce. Um, he, um, you know, comes from actually a winemaking family. So his, his father was Thai, his mother uh, was, uh, you know, Jewish American. Um, his uncle though, his great uncle, uh, Safasi uh, Mahagurang um, owned Mekong whiskey, sold it, and then uh, realized his dream in 1973 of buying a Sonoma winery, uh, which he rechristened. It had an Italian name originally, but he loved French wine. Uh, so he rechristened it uh, Domaine St. George after the famous uh, Burgundy. And so uh, Kenny grew up on the, on the, on the vineyard. Um, and uh, he wanted to be a skater surfer bum, um, uh, but he says uh, when he was in college, his advisor told him, this is a direct quote, when my advisor told me uh, I would have to teach to make a living as a poet, I fled, which is like the most amazing quote ever. Um, and, you know, obviously uh, makes him, you know, uh, my, you know, instant hero. Um, but he, he launched, he went to UC Davis, uh, you know, which is, you know, the preeminent school of winemaking in um, in America, um, and, and established a label uh, named after a Thai tree called Banyan, making converts, and then launched Hobo Wine Company, um, which uh, the wine that we're drinking uh, is a part of. So he uh, operates according to this negotiant mode, um, a lot like our, our friend Mary Taylor, but he does so throughout California. Um, and so in this case, he's working with fruit from uh, Mendocino uh, County. Uh, so uh, Mendocino County is just north of uh, Sonoma. Um, and uh, you, you have fog creeping down the Alexander Valley there, um, which uh, gives you this cooling influence. Uh, this is from, you know, um, a hob, kind of like a hodgepodge of, of, of um, Italian uh, slash Croatian varietals um, and, and then and Carignan. So you have 87% Zin, 10% Carignan, and 3% Barbera. What I love about this wine is the way it puts the lie to what most people think of, um, you know, conventionally for Zin. So, you know, I think Zinvidel is this behemoth. Um, you know, it, it accumulates sugar really beautifully as it ripens, um, and it's a massive wine. We're going to taste a massive wine for the sake of the Martinelli. Over 16% alcohol, again, like somewhat miraculously over 16% alcohol and, and, you know, dry enough uh, through the ages of native yeast. But um, I love, uh, Kenny works with native yeast. He makes natural wine, you know, at an affordable price. So, you know, his criteria, you know, he's like, wants to make wine for his skater friends, um, you know, and, and, and as such, you know, he's not going to charge them, you know, you know, 40 bucks for Cali's Inn. Um, but he's making wines that are, you know, in, in my mind, you know, as honest, um, you know, as, you know, sustainable, certainly, and as soulful as anything else being made in California. Um, and he makes wine throughout the Central Coast uh, and the North Coast. But um, I always love his Zins. 
Uh, Zin was actually one of the first uh, wines that he got. Um, you know, uh, a lot of press for Dry Creek Zin was from a different corner of Sonoma, not the Mendocino Zin. Uh, this is kind of like a more entry level offering, but I, I thought this one would be fun to try in the context of this lineup, just because it's lighter um, uh, and easier drinking. Um, uh, let me know what you think of uh, Kenny Zin. So any, any thoughts from uh, the folks in the audience about uh, the first Zinvindel we're trying or uh, Zinvindel uh, in particular? Um, as an American, uh, air quote, grape. There was a strawberry starburst note, a um, little bit of that like candy confectionery, but I think, you know, like, having that like bright acidity, like probably balances it out. I'm speculating. Yeah, that's a, that's a great tasting note. You know, for me, uh, Zin, you know, just like um, Chardonnay kind of charts this path from stone fruit to tropicalia, uh, Zin exists on this continuum of berry fruit, and like when it's less ripe, it's more of these like lighter, um, you know, kind of like tart, you know, strawberry, raspberry, um, you know, types of fruit. And then as it gets uh, riper, you know, you get more of those blackberries, you know, more of that like, you know, candied and, and dried, you know, uh, fruit. Um, and, and I think this definitely vibrates on that, you know, strawberry uh, wavelength um, as opposed to, you know, something, you know, more, uh, you know, concentrated. Um, you know, for the sake of, you know, uh, the Zins uh, that we're going to be trying uh, subsequently. Uh, what else you guys have? Um, I have some just general questions about California, but not necessarily about Zin. Let's go through the rest of the flight, maybe circle back. Uh, that sounds great. Um, way to keep us on, on target. Uh, new <laughs> year, new wine school, Zoe. Nicely done. Uh, so Brown, Brown Family Zin. Uh, Zoe uh, actually gets uh, the credit. Um, uh, I, I was not familiar with the state and, uh, um, you know, uh, Zoe sought out, um, you know, wines from BPOC winemakers, um, uh, you know, uh, while uh, we were in the midst of our opening journey and, um, you know, uh, stumbled upon uh, a Browns Inn, hashtag Browns Inn, uh, Napa Valley's first uh, black owned winery. Uh, this is a family, um, awesome quirk of history. So um, obviously, you know, no um, uh, wines from descendants of Tamil Nadu, although, you know, Thailand, South Asian-ish, um, you're gonna have to give me the benefit of the doubt there, metaphorically, but uh, much more direct connection uh, for the sake of uh, Brown Estates, which I, I think is, is super cool. So um, this is a Brown family, uh, Bassett and uh, Marcella are um, uh, on uh, your right. Um, uh, Bassett himself is Jamaican, um, so fucking awesome. Um, and they purchased a 450 acre farm in Napa Valley. It's actually in, it's called Chiles Valley, and I'll pull up a map which is kind of off the main drag, um, which is kind of a warmer corny, corner of the valley, even, even by Napa Valley standards. Uh, but it was a historic property. Um, and uh, there's an 1857 stone redwood barn that they've refurbished um, uh, for the sake of a production facility there. Um, and they grew grapes and they supplied Mike uh, Gigrich, um, uh, the uh, son of Croatian immigrants himself who um, made the wine at Chateau Montalena that won the Judgment of Paris and who first, you know, was one of the first few people that posited that Zinfandel could be related to a Croatian varietal. But they um, uh, sold grapes to him um, for many years. Um, uh, but uh, the uh, younger generation, uh, Deneen, uh, David, and Carol, and David really is the creative force for the sake of uh, winemaking um, uh, in the center on the left there, um, uh, starting in 19, uh, 1995, uh, started uh, making their own Zin. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, Zinfandel really is their, um, their baby um, and their animal for the sake of wine. And, um, you know, they're, they're working, you know, with older uh, methods for the sake of, you know, um, you know their, their fermentations. Um, uh, they're judicious with the use of oak, you know, 33% Zin wears oak well. Um, um, in this case, they're using a mix of French um, and uh, American oak. Um, what I think is kind of cool is David has started to reach outside of um, the family's estate vineyards uh, when he's building uh, this blend. Um, so I'm going to pull up a map of uh, Napa. And we have yet to do a Napa Valley lesson uh, because I have a hugely, well, actually, I Napa Valley bugs me for a lot of different reasons that, you know, we'll get into <laughs> at a later time. Um, uh, but um, anyway, you see Chilis Valley here. You can see actually Brown Estate um, at the bottom uh, corner of uh, the Napa uh, Valley here. Um, but they're also um, borrowing fruit uh, for the sake of this wine, um, some from Howe Mountain and some from Calistoga. And it is, you know, it, it seems somewhat counterintuitive, but 
you know, the valley actually gets warmer as you go north to some extent. Uh, once you get to Calistoga, it starts to get cooler again because there's uh, influence of elevation and another um, kind of coastal influence. But you have fog coming up from the bay here, um, such that if you've ever driven down Napa Valley, you know, you have this universal experience of going from, you know, clear blue skies to fog at some point during your journey between Yachtville and Napa proper, um, especially if you're driving midday and the fog hasn't burned off yet. Um, you know, but, you know, that cooling influence of the fog means that, uh, you know, uh, Napa, um, you know, Yachtville in particular, Oakville uh, are cooler than St. Helena, uh, which is really kind of like the sweet spot for the sake of, you know, as hot as it gets in Napa. Uh, Chile's Valley is actually pretty warm because you have another um, you know, set of uh, mountains uh, separating it from the coastal influence. So it gets very hot here. Um, but uh, in this vintage, they started to add, you know, zin from cooler climates to flush this wine out. Or, or it should be said, you know, not flush it out, to, to give it, you know, a little more uh, elegance. But, you know, I think in terms of the flavor profile in this one, you're getting much more into that, like, darker uh, berry fruit, um, which I dig, but it's still, like, hugely elegant um, in and of its own right um, in, in a really awesome way. Um, and then uh, for the sake of the last wine, um, Giuseppe and Luisa, um, you know, what's not to like about a wine named after Giuseppe and Luisa? Um, you saw the gnarled old Zinfandel vine earlier, um, which is from um, uh, their jackass hill. Um, and that is not like a marketing gimmick for the sake of, you know, calling a, a winery jackass hill. Uh, it's called that because it's a steep site along the Russian River uh, and uh, the... Uh, kind of founders, farmers, friends said only a jackass would work, you know, that hill. Um, now, this particular uh, Zinfandel, it comes from uh, vine material uh, that was borrowed from the vines that you saw earlier. So it's not those planting, it's, you know, plantings that are essentially Massal selected. So instead of looking for, you know, clones from a nursery, they um, grafted clones from those vines into a site above the winery, which is closer to Healdsburg. Um, and they made this wine, uh, which is dense and inky. Um, all sorts of cross-pollination here. You know, we talked about uh, the uh, gentleman behind uh, Thela, Aaron Jordan, working at Turley Wine. Um, the Martinelli family, they're great growers. Still, to this day, 80-90% of their fruit are their fruit. Um, but uh, uh, they have a female winemaker. And then Helen Turley, um, uh, who formerly, um, you know, worked at um, the eponymous Turley uh, sellers uh, is one of their consultants. And Helen um, is, you know, arguably the most famous winemaker in California of her generation um, and favors this lusher, more opulent style. And um, this is a miraculous wine for me. Um, I'm going to be honest with you. It's not my favorite wine um, in the world. Uh, stylistically, it's not a style that I tend to gravitate to, but it's a miracle that it doesn't taste like cough syrup. Um, you can see Giuseppe and Luisa here, um, you know, uh, big ups. Um, to the original Italian uh, immigrants. But um, this uh, is tipping the scales at over 16% alcohol, uh, even though it's native yeast fermented. The, the yeast should have died. Um, it's remarkable that they were able to like, uh, you know, finish things out um, as native yeast. But, you know, it's a big wine. It's plush. It's full fruited. You know, there are a lot of people who love, you know, this style. You know, I personally tend to favor wines that are a little leaner. You know, but what I dig about it is that it does have you know, its own internal wine rhyme scheme. It doesn't fall flat under its own weight. You know, it still has some semblance of balance in spite of that, you know, uh, significant uh, weight. Um, what else you got uh, for questions, uh, Zoe? Um, and, you know, feel free to, to weigh in, um, you know, with more, you know, subjective judgments about each of these offerings, um, you know, uh, greatest hits, you know, low lights. Um, you know, I'm at a point in my, wine school career where I'm confident enough that you can tell me if this is like the worst class you've ever attended, the worst flight of wines you've ever tasted. Um, you know, let's keep it real uh, in 2021 because this pandemic shit is getting old. Um, what do you got, Zoe? Um, in, indeed. Um, is this the Steve Martinelli's family as our favorite sparkling apple cider? Um, I don't think so. I want to imagine that they're like, Paisan, you know, just like, you know, every dishwasher that we ever hire is like Primo or Prima, you know, in, you know, Honduras or Guatemala, you know, I'm sure the, like the Martinelli's, you know, they're, you know, Primo or Prima somewhere um, in the old country, but 
as far as I know, they don't have anything to do with the cider. Although they grew apples for generations and Sonoma, the parts of Sonoma that weren't, you know, consistently under vine were planted to apples. Um, and there's actually a lot of old folk wisdom, um, you know, that says that, you know, former apple orchards are well suited uh, to grapes as well. Absolutely. Um, I have a fantastic question here. So like, let's say that you are at a congressional wine caucus and it's only Ooh. serving California Chardonnay. What can you eat if you don't like California Chardonnay that's too buttery or oaky to like balance that out? Slash what's Ooh. like in the regular bar area that you could do to like mask that flavor if that's Ooh. good. This is, uh, this is really great practical knowledge. <laughs> uh, for the, it's actually, it's, it's deeply sad though. So usually after the inauguration, they do a luncheon um, for uh, Congress. And it's, it's traditional that, you know, the luncheon features either the home state wines of the organizers. So I can remember uh, you know, Chuck Schumer featured New York state wines because he organized Obama's um, uh, first inaugural luncheon. Um, and, you know, it is disappointing, we, you know, Kamala didn't get that. Uh, or California wine didn't get that treatment. Um, it's also uh, lucky because uh, no one wants to drink Delaware wine. Uh, we don't want to inflict that on anyone. Um, uh, so uh, fatty, fatty things. So you want to hit up, um, you know, like the La Quercia Iowa prosciutto stand, um, <laughs> you know, would be a great, um, you know, you want richer dishes. And, and again, I think it speaks to, you know, that like the cheese bar, um, you know, that Calgore Creamery stand, um, any any local cheeses, um, you know, will work beautifully with these wines. These these are you know wines that want loud flavors, um, which I actually think is kind of poetic for the sake of uh, Kamala's roots, because you know uh, you're talking about cuisines for the sake of you know Tamil Nadu, and and I, I I fucking love Indian cuisine, but I think you know there's a sense you know with India and and, and you know not unlike you know Mexican cuisine or pretty much any you know larger polyglot nation that. You know, there's one Indian cuisine, there's one Mexican cuisine, but, you know, India is, is incredibly diverse linguistically, culinarily. And so uh, Tamil Nadu cuisine is very different than other Indian cuisines. Actually, like huge vegetarian influence there. As you get closer to Sri Lanka, it gets like, like stupidly spicy. Um, uh, but, um, you know, a lot of loud flavors there in a cool way. Similarly, uh, Jamaica, a lot of loud flavors. Um, you know, there's a lot, there's a strong vegetarian uh, movement there. A lot of Rastafaris are actually vegetarian. A lot of Caribbean restaurants uh, will have like a fun, like like uh, vegetarian or vegan, uh, like, uh, you know, sub menu. Um, and actually I mean, there's a huge Indian community, like subcontinental Indian community um, throughout the Caribbean too. And, and, you know, it's a fascinating, you know, place for the sake of the development of their, their cuisine. So um, I like these wines with louder flavors. So, um, you know, like if you're stuck with mixed nuts, then, you know, that'll do it. You know, that'll work with some of the oak. Um, you know, maybe go for like the fattier nuts, maybe go for the cashews, you know, maybe go for the Marconas. Um, if, you know, this, I don't, I don't know if they're going to spring for Marconas at the, you know, congressional buffet, but, you know, cheeses, um, I think are, you know, the, your, your ultra luxe, like triple creams, you know, your fattier dishes, that's, that's where you want, you know, to, to make a dive, uh, for, um, you know, but I will say that only goes so far, um, if they're throwing, you know, um, you know, just bad catering wines at you, you know, I tend to go for beer or, you know, just like, uh, I tend to nurse, uh, um, you know, bourbon on the rocks. It's that, that's what happens to me at weddings. Um, uh, but you know, neither here nor there. <laughs> Very well done. I usually just go to gin. Um, oh, that's, that's great. <laughs> Sometimes I want to mix it with gin. Sometimes I want gin on its own. And I actually like light beer at a wedding because it just like, you know, it just like keeps you, you know, you can still like dance and, you know, and you're not, you're in for the long haul, but, you know, you're steady. So, all right. Neither here nor there. Uh, <laughs> what else? We, we, we've gone totally off the rails. Zoe. What else? You, what else you? <laughs> um, this is a really good question that I love to um, talk about is what did wineries do during Prohibition? Uh, excellent question. Hugely fascinating. Um, so a lot of different things. Um, uh, so there was an exemption during prohibition for sacramental wine. So some of them sold sacramental wine. Um, some of them sold, uh, grapes, um, for home consumption. Um, so, uh, they would be shipped across the country to people that wanted to make their own wine. And some grapes did better than others. So like Petit, like, um, Petit Syrah 
is as popular to some extent in, in California as it is because it's indestructible and it was a great grape to ship uh, east uh, to make to make wine out of. Um, you know, uh, but, you know, a lot of them just died, uh, sadly. You know, a lot of them, you know, a lot of people just um, left, um, you know, or they, they, they either left the land or they, you know, pivoted, you know, for the sake of, of what they were growing. And, you know, that happened to, to most of them. Um, but, you know, the, the ones that survived, and, and there are some like Simi, Corbell, um, Stefanelli. So there are these like, you know, iconic names in Sonoma that, you know, are from Stromsburg, um, was, was founded in the 1880s by German immigrant. Um, you know, so there are these like great names that survived. Um, and there is this continuity for the sake of, um, you know, that history in California that's hugely compelling for me, um, you know, and I think it's really awesome. But, um, you know, most of them didn't, um, you know, not, not to put a, you know, too, too much of a silver lining on it. Um, could you talk a little bit about how there could be residual sugar in red wines, particularly if they're vinified to 13.5, like the Thalia is in? Well, so think about the Zinfandel we're drinking. Uh, this is 16.4% uh, alcohol. Uh, also, this is the original label. Uh, this is the original artwork uh, on, on the wine, um, which I think is, is uh, big ups. Jessica Biel will be making amazing artwork out of this, but uh, uh, that's why it has that like retro... Um, I don't know, I don't know what to call this design scheme, but, um, at any rate, um, uh, so 13, 16.4% uh, alcohol. Um, so you're dealing with, um, you know, at least like four bricks worth of ripeness there that's unconsumed for the sake of generating alcohol, which is shit ton of sugar. Um, you know, so, uh, imagine really red grapes, um, and imagine landing at 13% alcohol, but a wine that could ferment fully dry to 16%, you have a lot of leftover sugar, but that could be a good thing. And, and again, you know, it's actually a fun exercise, you know, take, take like a Beaujolais, take a really lean red wine um, and add a little bit of sugar water to it. And, and the, your perception of the wine changes. Uh, if you add, you know, small enough, you know, a dribble, it doesn't change for the sake of making a wine sweet. It changes your experience of the fruit of a wine. It changes not only your perception on the palate, but your perception, you know, on the nose, you know, so what is hugely fascinating for me about the variable of taste and smell is that you can't tease things out. You can't say that, you know, something's at, you know, one particular level and, you know, so if we raise or lower it, you know, it's going to taste you know, a different way. You know, it exists in context and it responds in context. And, you know, you, you know, you can't divorce one from the other any more than you can the action of, you know, uh, you know, the um, mycorrhiza, you know, acting, you know, uh, in concert with vine roots, you know, so, so, you know, it's this whole ecology for the sake of a wine, um, you know, that we experience as the, the sum total of the product. And, you know, sugar is important and sweetness is important. And it's not, you know, to make a wine sweeter is not to always make it perceptibly sweet. Um, and I, I think people sleep on that uh, to, to some extent. Um, uh, and, and then, you know, concurrently this, I think this would taste sweet, does taste sweet to a lot of people, but, um, you know, a lot of that is about a, um, a perception of sweetness because of the ripeness of the fruit, as opposed to an empirical level of, uh, sugar left over in the, the ultimate, ultimate wine. Um, you know, so just like so many different variables, um, you know, at play, uh, for the, for the sake of these things. And, you know, you know, sugar is, is one of many factors that winemakers play with you know, to um, uh, create, you know, a compelling uh, whole. Um, and in California, historically, for the sake of mass marketed wines, that has meant the wines are not dry. Um, you know, everybody will tell you they like dry wines, but they like, you know, and, and, and this is, you know, th these are, you know, the people that buy the bulk of wine at Costco and shit. This is not necessarily the tail of goat, you know, wine school, but, you know, uh, people like things that are a little sweet. Um, uh, because, you know, they have this fullness, this ripeness, you know, this approachability. Um, uh, and oak sometimes creates that as well. Um, but, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, certainly sugar does. Um, and, and it's important not to, not to underestimate that. Uh, so so uh, we're going to taste uh, a little bit here. Um, uh, we're going to toast, uh, finally, with um, uh, Schramsberg. So uh, this is uh, Blanc de Blanc. So um, uh, uh, our... 
Uh, <laughs> I love saying our second worst president, um, Richard Nixon, uh, <laughs> uh, started the tradition of uh, serving Schramsberg um, uh, for uh, you know official state functions uh, when he um, uh, went to China um, and toasted to peace in 1972, which raises so many questions for me that I haven't fully answered yet because ostensibly China would be um, you know on the teetotaler train because you know um, you know uh, alcohol is the opiate of the masses among, among other things, but um, neither here nor there. Uh, he brought Schramsberg with him to. Um, uh, shortly after the Davies family um, assumed control of the state. Um, uh, the um, estate was founded by a German immigrant um, in the 1880s who dug out these um, uh, amazing cellars um, in above Calistoga um, using the same migrant labor force that dug um, uh, the, the Transcontinental Railroad. Um, and, uh, you know, so it's, it's really steeped in history, uh, this estate. And um, it's an amazing place to visit. Um, you know, the wines... They make a shit ton of wine. It's sold at um, like Trader Joe's, but you know Trader Joe's sells a lot of cool stuff. Um, so don't let that you know. Please, the next time you're there, buy the dark chocolate covered almonds. They're amazing. Um, but uh, you know it, they're they're really special for me, for me, you know, personally because it is you know they have this con continuity uh, for the sake of serving your wine at the White House. And so about seventy percent of this fruit comes from Napa, but thirty percent uh, comes from Sonoma because um, you know Sonoma fruit is essential to um, American, you know, California sparkling wine because you need something with acid. You couldn't make a wine, like a convincing sparkling wine um, out of um, entirely Napa, Napa grown fruit, largely, um, unless it was all from Conaris, but neither, neither here nor there. But um, this is all shard all the time. Um, and we are gonna toast to um, uh, Madam uh, uh, Vice President, uh, long may she reign. Uh, I hope to, you know, uh, pour her wine at uh, some point in the near uh, future. And I hope you are all um, enjoying uh, life under the new administration uh, at home. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Cheers. There's just nothing, there's nothing wrong with that. It should be said too. Um, so I did this amazing uh, tasting uh, with uh, the Davies family. They uh, have owned the estate since the 60s. They, re they kind of refurbished, rehabilitated it. Um, and it was a tasting of their like ultra luxe prestige cuvee alongside, you know, Krug and some of the greatest names of champagne. It was actually, it was really interesting. Um, I was with this like uh, a guy who was formerly a, a Somme at the French Laundry and stuff like that. And he said that Krug tasted like uh, old Chinese food, uh, which it does actually. Um, and I also love like day old Chinese food, but um, uh, Schramsberg compared really family, like favorably to a lot of those wines. Uh, it was just fuller. So, um, you know, I think their wines, their grapes are riper at harvest than a lot of the grapes uh, you would find in Champagne. So, you know, their sparkling wines tend to be lusher, richer, rounder uh, often. Um, and they also, um, you know, a portion of the wine, um, in this case, I think about a quarter of it um, sees, uh, you know, thyme and oak prior to secondary fermentation, which, you know, lends, lends weight to the resultant blend. But it really is an icon. And I, I think, you know, Sonoma has that, you know, it has these you know, we're a young country, um, you know, compared to, um, you know, the old world. You know, you have an estate here, um, uh, you know, that is on its sixth generation, um, which is remarkable, um, you know, but, you know, in the old world, you know, they scoff at that. You know, the Alfonso Malo is on his like 17th generation, you know, what is six generations uh, to them, you know, and, and they survived the French Revolution, you know, um, they didn't just survive prohibition, um, you know, so, uh, you know, I, I like, that, you know, uh, California wine has this depth of history. Um, and, you know, you have this product like Schramsberg that, you know, is, you know, kind of nationally iconic uh, in, in a way. And I think that's worth honoring um, and appreciating sustaining uh, for the sake of our wines, because, you know, wine has a long memory um, and, you know, there is, you know, value um, in that, in that sense of tradition. Uh, what do you got, Seth? Great question from Todd. Um... Could you elaborate a little bit more on how the over ex, um, expensive land cost in Napa Valley is causing some wineries to plant um, a little bit um, too closely together and these like higher yields are just like ruining Napa wine, how you feel about that if you want to dig deep into any specific wineries that are doing this? 
Um, I mean, I, I don't know. I don't know specific actors. The thing about Napa, the thing about like California in general is it's just like, um, and, and, you know, Napa even more in Sonoma is like geographically limited. So, you know, you have, you know, this relatively narrow valley um, at the end of the day. Um, and, you know, water's an issue. Uh, the water table's an issue. Um, and, you know, not a lot of people dry farm. You know, a lot, like a lot of these wines wouldn't exist if it weren't for irrigation. Um, and, you know, there are, you know, uh, kind of availability issues for the sake of water throughout um, the West, throughout California. And the water table can only drop so much before it fully disappears. Um, and, you know, they're learning that and realizing that in, in Sonoma. Um, and then on top of that, you know, you have this issue of, you know, sustainable development um, and, you know, how much wine, you know, or how much acreage do you want to give over to, um, you know, really water intensive agriculture versus, you know, you know, kind of these other species that have evolved to thrive in this water deficient um, environment. Um, and so Napa is kind of maxed out for the sake of uh, its vineyard acreage. Um, and, you know, that's a big part of the reason that, you know, vineyard land is so expensive there. Um, it's, it's maxed out, you know, environmentally, but it's also maxed out, you know, for the sake of kind of like the tourist, tourist infrastructure. So like pre-COVID, like you can't, like there's a traffic jam, you know, running north and south in, in Napa and like they can't sustain much more tourism um, than they, they currently, you know, welcome. And it's been a boon to them. Obviously it, it's, it made them, you know, certainly the most famous brand stateside, you know, but, you know, how do you save your soul in the midst of that? You know, how do you, um, you know, stay a wine region as opposed to a wedding venue? Um, and there are a lot of people trying to grapple with that. Um, you know, uh, there are a lot of people that like are trying to grapple with that in a really like, you know, thoughtful way, like Kathy Corson, we used to get her Christmas card. I don't, I haven't gotten it yet at, uh, uh, tail go to revelers but she's awesome she's like lovely she makes wine in the hottest corner of napa yet she makes wines that are hugely elegant she makes cabs that are elegant even in warm vintages it's impossible um you know and she's just like lovely um and she makes wine on a small scale and her husband does the books and it's like you know they're like in their own way the the porter creek of you know the napa valley corridor um and she doesn't get the credit she deserves for making you know you know delicious wines um you know, but that whole infrastructure is totally detached from the point system. So actually like, funny, like last night, um, like my wife and I, we got a bunch of wines when we got married, which is like almost a decade ago now. And uh, one of them was from, you know, this Sonoma County winery and it was like heralded and got a million points in 2008. And we cracked it because, you know, I was going to do this, this class today. And it just like, it tasted like prune juice, you know, it's just like, you know, it's unremarkable. And, and there's way too much wine being made in Napa that tastes that way. Um, you know, it's, it's not soulful. It only has like dried fruit to recommend it. And, you know, but beyond that, like the, the winemaking infrastructure is not about, you know, this, um, you know, tradition of, of making wine a part of the fabric of the table. It's about um, luxury living and, you know, influencing and branding and, you know, like, yeah, wedding venues for Kardashian disciples. And it's like, it's just like the, for me, it's like all the things that uh, I want to dissociate myself from for the sake of wine. Um, and, and again, that's not to say that there aren't people making really thoughtful wines in Napa. It's just like, as a brand, it's just like poisoned. Um, and environmentally, it's equally potentially poisoned. Um, Sonoma is lucky because it's close enough to the coast that you can dry farm. Um, but again, you know, that might not be the case for you know, the Russian River Valley in half a century. What was the name of the winery you just spoke of? Corson. The Porter Creek of Napa? Oh, Cor Cor Kathy Corson. Uh, no, uh, Kathy Corson. C-O-R-I-S-O-N. We, we sell her, um, we sell her, um, she makes wine, this like really famous Sonoma vineyard called Kronos. Um, mm -hmm. We don't, we don't sell that one. We sell her like entry level. Um, and it's like full fruited, but like really elegant. Um, there are a lot of people that make, so I should be, I should say too, that like old school Napa Cab is one of my favorite inventions of the world. I love like, so Dunn Vineyards or Dunn um, makes really awesome wine. They actually like strip the alcohol from it in some years and it still works. Um, mm -hmm. uh, and like my commas, like there are a lot of people making like 
lines that you, you can't make old, you can't make, you know, Bordeaux in California. You shouldn't try to, you know, you yeah. should learn from Bordeaux and make wine, you know, with the exuberance of California, but make wine that is balanced, you know, nonetheless. And, and, and I think that's the story of modern California wine is this, um, and, and I love the way David Ramey in particular encapsulates that is, you know, he used to use a lot more oak in his wine um, and he's backed off, but he's always, you know, been scrupulous about, um, you know, using native yeast um, and, you know, uh, you know, backing off, you know, other interventions in the cellar. He, he doesn't filter his wines, he finds them. It's like very different in its own way. Um, and he's about understanding the differences and he's released ap academic papers. So like, he's, he's like working naturally but scrupulously so and i think that's something that really goes missing in the natural wine world sometimes um you know people are all too you know ready to trade on a hip label without making something that doesn't suck <laughs> um and that's not to, like there's something exciting about that like a fun label and a wine that's like really lively and bright and you know vinegared even at like in 25 dollars is great but i don't want to spend 35 dollars for that but I would spend as much for one of David's shards as I would for Montrachet. No, I haven't spent that much for wine in a while, but anyway. Hashtag pandemic restaurant ownership. Yeah, yeah. Uh, what else you got? Um, no, that's about it. I do want to say that, like, I had some early um, 1970s, like, library selections of BV that, like, I that were so good. And I had them when they were like 35, 40 years old. But like, you could see that that um, time in history, it really was just like, we're Americans. We are like subject to fads and we're gonna like go in and out of certain like winemaking traditions every whatever cycle. And hopefully we'll find our own footing when we grow out of our adolescence, you know? Yeah, yeah, totally. And I mean, I love, I love this wines are all at 12 and a half percent alcohol. Um, uh, I, I also have discovered in uh, 2021 the grid view. I don't know how it took me this long to discover, but uh, it's amazing to see more faces. Uh, Maggie Parker was like dancing. Uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, <laughs> uh, but, but uh, uh, I will, I need to, I need to, uh, I need to stay on the grid view um, mm -hmm. uh, at all times because uh, it is absolutely delightful uh, to see. Yeah, it has a lot of features now. Yeah, well, no, it's delightful to see as many, as many of you in the mix as as there are. And, you know, I'm honored that, you know, as many of you continue to, yes, uh, <laughs> to keep nice, nice voguing uh, that, that continue to, to sign up for this, um, you know, 90 minutes on uh, as, as do. Um, at any rate, uh, let's, uh, let's toast again uh, to uh, the, the year to come, um, you know, uh, to uh, the promise of uh, a new administration, the promise of uh, a new year wine school. I will be, uh, you know, uh, engaging, uh, we're going to kick this off uh, every other week. Uh, it's going to be an every other week phenomenon, uh, as opposed to every week. I'll have a, a proper syllabus uh, for the new semester for you um, uh, come uh, Wednesday and the, the, um, uh, the recap on Monday. Uh, that said, we're going to, you know, intersperse additional programming and fundraisers and stuff. So uh, the idea here is that I can spend an occasional uh, Sunday, uh, you know, uh, at home, but also uh, explore um, you know, other, um, you know, beverage, uh, you know, kind of flights, flights of fancy, but um, it is uh, a pleasure to be uh, in your virtual midst. Um, thank you all uh, so much, uh, wherever you're joining us. So.